Hello everyone, this is All Logarithms Equal, and due to some popular demand, I'll be making a video on the law of sines and law of cosines. The, the case that is ambiguous when it comes to the law of, laws of sines and cosines is when we have basically SSA, or in other words, true side lengths, and the value of an angle, in other words, the measurement of some angle that is not in between those two sides. There is, in fact, a rather logical step-by-step -step pro process that you can follow in order to evaluate these problems correctly. As with learning anything, you just need some patience and some practice, so bear with me. First, you find the value of the altitude of the triangle. Now, this value is a constant given the SSA information. So, in other words, it doesn't change. It doesn't really... Uh, it's, it's unambiguous, in other words, is the point I'm trying to make, given the uh, constraints that are the two side lengths and the angle that you're starting with. So you don't have to worry about that particular, you know, the value of the altitude, the length of the altitude, as being uh, ambiguous or, or like, oh, what if we get different, you know, answers for, for this step? You don't have to worry. Note that you know the value of the side length opposite your given angle. And so you should consider, you should, you should actually compare this length with the altitude. There are actually three distinct cases to consider in this case. Uh, if A, meaning the, the side opposite the angle, opposite the known angle, I should say, is less than h, h being the height, or the value of the altitude, in other words, the, the length of the altitude, then no triangle can possibly exist. Now, if a is equal to h, so those two values are equal, uh, meaning that the, the side opposite the given angle and the altitude, the length of the altitude, are actually equal in length, then there is one, one and only one, triangle possible, and it's a right triangle. In fact, this implies that the side opposite our known angle is literally the altitude, because there's no other way that it can be. And if A is greater than H, in other words, if uh, we have a case where the opposite side length is actually greater than the length of the altitude uh, that we just computed, then there are, in fact, two distinct triangles possible. One of these triangles is acute, and the other is obtuse, and we'll have to figure out some data for each triangle in order to solve the problem. But before we start computing things, let me just share another factor you should be aware of. If the angle given is obtuse, in other words, the, the, the angle length measurement given is greater than 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians, or a quarter turn angle, or 100 radians, then you should make sure that the value of A, the side length opposite the given angle, is greater in length than the other given side, or else no triangle can possibly exist. And you can explore this on your own. I encourage, I encourage you to do so. I'll probably put up some diagrams to show you. Here is a case where basically the angle length is obtuse, and the side length opposite the given angle is, of course, greater in length than the other given side, so it's, it's clear that this triangle is possible. But here, by contrast, if we had, you know, some kind of opposite side length that is insufficiently long, in other words, it's not as long as the other given side, or it's equal in length to the, the other given side, uh, side length, I should say, then uh, no triangle can possibly exist. And that, that should be pretty clear from these diagrams, because there's no way to close off this triangle in a way that, that makes any sense with the, the given angle information, because we're given that the angle is obtuse. So you should do this check before you start calculating any angle values uh, when you're given a kind of problem with laws of sines and laws of cosines. Now, the only case that's really too difficult, or you know, a kind of a, a step up in terms of the, the challenge level, is the case where two triangles are possible, of course. So I'll show you a robust procedure uh, to follow in order to solve these cases, to give you an example uh, to show how it works. Let's say we have an ambiguous case where we have a side length 7 and 8, uh, and opposite the side length equal to 7, 
we have uh, an angle that is known, and suppose it's uh, 43 degrees. What we can do from there is, well, the first thing, you know, first things first, though not necessarily in that order, we compare 7, the length of that opposite side on your right, we compare that to basically 8 times the sine of alpha, where alpha, of course, is 43 degrees, as you can see. So we're actually comparing, you know, basically seeing where 7 falls, this value of a here, in comparison to 8 sine 43, and you can compute the a times the sine of 43 degrees, and that comes out to about 5.456 units, and so therefore it uh, sort of follows from that that 7 lies in between the value 8 and 8 sine uh, alpha. And so that, you know, we can see actually in this sort of diagram that I made that basically if A is between B and B sine alpha, then there are in fact two, triangle, uh, two triangles possible, two distinct triangles. And so that is our sort of middle sort of middle range in which uh, we do in fact have an ambiguous case. So for that reason, we can proceed. And in fact, you know, your first instinct from this is probably to make use of the law of signs, and that's okay. We can sort of start the same way that we would normally start in any one of these problems, you know, in, even in one of the problems where it isn't ambiguous. So, so we can set up this, this equation here using the law of signs. So the sine of 43 divided by 7, this is in degrees, of course, because 7 is the side opposite the angle, 43 degrees, and we set that equal to the sine of beta divided by 8, because those are, of course, uh, corresponding measurements as well. And so what follows, and so what's important here, what I'd really like to emphasize, is that basically the value for the sine of beta is constant. So you can treat that as a constant. That will also never change. You can, in fact, if you want to, you can treat it as basically one of the given bits of information, the sine of beta. This is very important, okay? Because this is the distinction, the, the important distinction that I'm making between beta and the sine of beta. It turns out in these ambiguous cases that these are two very different things. Beta can in fact take on two different values, as we'll see, but the sine of beta is a constant. It just has one and only one value there. So that's very important, uh, as, as you'll see. So basically, we know the sine of beta here, and if we were to just do something very primitive, as, you know, suppose you were just following steps as if this weren't an ambiguous case, you would probably just type this into your calculator and say, well, okay, what is the inverse sine of beta, or the inverse sine of 0.7794267, approximately. And you would do that, and the, the calculator would give one, and only one, output. However, you need to be careful, especially in this ambiguous case. You know it's ambiguous because you did the calculation with basically B sine of alpha. So you know it's ambiguous, so the value it gives for that arc sign, for that inverse sign, is actually not the only value you're looking for, it's just one of them. So we'll see that in a moment. Basically, you can do that to start with. We, we know that sine of beta, that's a constant. Suppose we, you know, for this first step here, from, from line one to line two, suppose we just typed it into a calculator. Well, that'll just give us the acute angle here, 51.2. Uh, degrees. I guess about 51.21, I should say, um, degrees. And, and so basically, we can use that in all of our following equations. In other words, if we treat that as our value of beta here, then we can solve for gamma, which is at the top, you can, you know, which of course by the, the triangle sum theorem is going to be 180 degrees minus the sum of the other two angles. So Basically, it's 180 minus 43 minus this 51.21, approximately, and so we can end up with 85 degrees, uh, and a, a different acute angle for the value of gamma. And then C, we can, we can solve for this length in this one triangle by using the law of sines, or in fact the law of cosines. It's actually a choice, believe it or not. Um, but either way, the result will be the same, and it's going to be about 10.236 units, whatever our units are. Maybe it's inches, maybe it's centimeters, maybe it's miles, perhaps. But anyway, that's the whole idea of, of, of solving 
an ambiguous case. But but remember, we're not done yet. We've only done half of the work. We've only found three values so far, and all those values are for one particular triangle. The other triangle we can get by taking 180 minus this initial value of beta, okay? And I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, so this is the other one, the other possible triangle, and uh, my diagram could be better for this, I will admit, because it should look different. <laughs> it is, in fact, a, a distinct triangle. It looks completely different, as a matter of fact, because, as you'll see, the value of beta is 180 minus 51.21, so it's actually an obtuse triangle, or an obtuse angle right there. Uh, so basically what we're looking at is, I, I can probably do this with a pen, although it might not look as neat, this angle now for beta, the side, or in other words, the angle opposite side B equal to 8, or whose length is equal to 8, I should say, um, that angle is now obtuse. It's now about 128 point eight degrees, rather than just like fifty or fifty one. Um, so then using, you know, pretty simple algebra after that, you know, after this step it's actually fairly simple because we can just solve that triangle. We know that gamma here is going to be a much smaller angle, it's only about eight degrees. And that makes sense because, you know, you know, that third angle can only be so large, given the triangle sums theorem. And then of course we can also solve for C which is just going to be this smaller value of about 1.465 units. And we can still, again, use either the law of sines or the law, law of cosines to get that value. But either way, you should be thinking along the way that, oh, it makes sense, what, you know, the values that we're getting. It makes sense that in this obtuse triangle, we get a smaller value for C. And that's always going to be true. Because there's, you know, there's just not as much room <laughs> for, for that triangle. You should see the diagram. I probably shouldn't gesticulate so much, but yes. So, that's basically how you would do that. That's, I wanted to show you an example of that. So here's an article in Plus Magazine, which is, by the way, an online magazine that I'd have to recommend to anyone at least mildly interested in mathematics. And it describes this forgotten trigonometric function called the Haversine function, and how it was actually once very important, it was actually vitally important, to ship navigators, people who, you know, who sailed ships back in the day and centuries ago, and who lived before the age of electronics and calculators. And so, it's actually very interesting. I, I encourage you to read it on your own, but the point is, we get this nice, simple, concise formula here involving the Haversine, and it makes use of basically these different angles representing the longitude and latitude and where it was, you know, basically trying to, to, well, yeah, where it was trying to go, basically, what its destination was. And then, basically, you can solve for D, which in this case is, in fact, the great circle distance. Because, of course, remember, the Earth is not, uh, you know, the Earth's not actually flat. The Earth is basically a spheroid. And so, this is one way of approximating the distance, the actual distance, that you would have to travel if you're you know, going in a certain direction, uh, and you have a destination in mind, and you know the longitude and latitude values of basically your set, your destination and where you currently are, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that the natural question that probably arises in your mind is, well, how do these navigators know their own latitude and longitude at any given time? You know, if they're just at sea, how exactly would they have that information? Well, it turns out there's a nice article about it, and I'll, I'll leave links in the description, of course, but it turns out that calculating latitude was fairly simple using a sextant, which is a particular kind of instrument uh, for judging the angle, it's basically using the, the sun, and it works even if you're out at sea. And longitude was much more of a challenge to calculate while you were at sea, until something called a chronometer was used. Uh, or invented, in fact, and that was in the 18th century. So, But by the s late 1700s and 1800s, ships could determine these values at arbitrary locations on Earth. So using those, they can actually make use of something that's called this formula, basically. It's called the Law of Haversines. And it's something very interesting that actually arises from the spherical Law of Cosines. That's right, a Law of Cosines for doing calculations on a sphere of arbitrary size. 
And of course, you can, you know, how it was used is basically they substituted the radius of the Earth, approximate radius of the Earth, in into these formulas. And this is what they ended up with. It's, it's really quite interesting, as a matter of fact. So, you know, not only could this give you the, the great circle distance, but, you know, if you also knew about how quickly you were going in your ship or vehicle of some sort, you could also then obviously estimate about how long it would take you to get there. So that's, you know, another cool application. Finally, remember, kids, all of this stuff is banned from public schools. After all, we know nowadays that there is no round Earth. It's a flat Earth, of course, so why bother even, even mentioning a Haversine formula? Who said anything about Haversine? It's, you know, if it's not in a curriculum, then why bother saying its name? It's not like it's genuinely interesting or useful. It'd be hopeless to try to make students interested in geometry by broadening the scope of what we teach them and giving teachers some creative license to teach some fascinating topics. Furthermore, it's, it's not like we live in some crazy fantasy land where the planet is some kind of spheroid inhabited by leprechauns, so why bother stretching our imaginations a little? I mean, could you imagine such a thing? I, I couldn't. Just to see how fake and phony this is, all it is is propaganda. It's ball earth garbage. Go from that position, I understand that they rock it, but what is the mechanism to straighten it out after being basically parallel and coming straight down? Someone want to explain that? I don't think so. Complete garbage. That's all SpaceX is. Nothing but propaganda. Nothing but lies.